Welcome back to Trendlines Over Headlines, the show where we break down the markets with some of the best traders and analysts out there. My name is Patrick Donawella. I'm the editor of The Chart Report and I'll be your host. We've got an awesome guest for you today. Matthew Tuttle is going to be joining us. Matthew is the founder and CEO of Tuttle Capital Management. He's known for creating the inverse Kathy Wood ETF, SARC, and the inverse Jim Cramer ETF, SJIM. So it's going to be a fun conversation. You're not going to want to miss it. But before we talk to Matt, it's Friday. The markets are closed. So let's take a quick look at how this week played out. Hey guys, thanks for watching. Just a quick reminder, be sure to click like and subscribe so we can continue bringing you awesome content. Thanks. The S&P 500 closed out the day, the week, the month, and the quarter today with gains across all time frames. It rose about 3.5% on the week, marking its third straight weekly gain. Taking a look at the other major indices, they all rose around 3% this week. Small caps actually led slightly, with the Russell 2000 gaining about 3.9%. Now, last week we talked about how small caps were really skating on thin ice as the Russell 2000 was testing those former highs from 2018, 2020, but buyers stepped in right where they needed to. So it's encouraging to see that level acting as support. Now, taking a quick look at the sectors, all 11 sectors closed higher this week by more than one and a half percent. Energy led gaining more than 6%. Healthcare lagged, but it still rose about 1.7%. That's enough out of me. Let's welcome Matthew onto the show. All right. Welcome to the show, Matthew, and thank you for joining us today. Hey, thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. And, you know, you're kind of the perfect guest to have on a show called Trend Lines Over Headlines. I mean, we started the chart report and this show out of the belief that the traditional financial media does a poor job of helping their viewers navigate the markets. And we think it's far better to listen to the markets via price action and rather than you know fixating on the headlines uh, in fact i think that's right from our mission statement verbatim uh, and without picking on anyone in particular the media seem it, it often seems like the media is the last ones on the bus you know they kill the best trends and whether it's the magazine cover indicator or jim cramer uh, by the time it hits the headlines it's usually too late. There's no more incremental buyers or sellers. Um, so do you share that same frustration? Do you agree with any of that? Yeah, I think when you say does a poor job, I think you're being overly kind. <laughs> um, you know, the, the the word I would use probably isn't fit for a podcast. But no, I, I agree 100%. I mean, you know, either they're on touting something that you know i was buying three months ago and am now looking to short or you know i love that anytime there's a stock that's down 30 percent on earnings there's somebody on fast money who just bought more of it like seven days ago and they go to them and ask them you know whether they still like it or not and kind of like yeah you know what i'd rather hear from the guy who shorted it seven days ago than the guy who bought more and then you know trying to explain why you know why they're still a bag holder yeah, yeah. So we're definitely on the same page there. But listen, my first question is actually from our mutual friend Todd Sohn over at Strategus Research. You know, he does a lot of work on ETFs. And I mentioned you were coming on the show and he said, you know, I know Matt uses charts to trade tactically. So I'd be curious to see how he uses charts and technicals uh, to manage the funds. Yeah. And, and it's not to manage the funds. Um, it's more, you know, I'm, you know, I launch funds that I like to trade, basically. I mean, I'm a trader. I've traded my own account since the mid 80s. Um, and yeah, I mean, I pretty much exclusively use charts. I'm more of a counter trend guy. So you know, I'm looking more, you know, buying dips and selling rips. Uh, you know, my favorite pattern, courtesy of Gil Morales, is undercut and rally. You know, I love undercut and rallies of previous lows or undercuts and rallies of, you know, moving averages. And yeah, and I try to blend in, you know, an understanding of kind of the macro environment. So I'm just not going to, you know, buy something or short it in a vacuum. 
I'd like to have some sort of, you know, some sort of macro underpinnings about, you know, why I think this area might be good to get into or or, or, or good to short. Um, and we actually we write a daily newsletter where, you know, I kind of put out what I'm looking at and why, what my watch list is. I mean, that changes a lot during the day. I mean, my entire watch list today just totally flipped. But, uh, you know, that's the nature of the beast. Yeah, and I like what you said there about how you look for, you know, kind of under, undercutting a low. And that's something I really like, too. Failed breakouts and failed breakdowns. I mean, sometimes it seems like those can be better moves than actual breakouts themselves, right? Those kind of fake out moves. Some people call them bull traps, bear traps, whatever you call yeah, them. Yeah, right? I mean, what, what I've seen is just, and, and maybe it's just this market, but breakouts just are not working. And, you know, and, and you see a lot of people on Twitter, you know, still kind of following and, you know, in Investors Business Daily breakout type of methodology and just getting savaged, you know, and, and they're buying something when I'm probably shorting it. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I, I and, and just from a, you know, comfort standpoint, I just, I like buying something when it's low versus, you know, trying to chase a trend. I just feel more comfortable that way. I love it. I love it. And I'll make sure to pass it on to Todd Sohn. Uh, But let's move on to the good stuff. I want to ask you about the inverse innovation ETF, SARC, which you launched back in November 2021. And it's essentially a bet against Kathy Wood. And I know you're not really involved with the ETF day to day anymore. It was acquired by AXS or Axis uh, not too long ago, but it's still your brainchild. Oh, yeah. Um, it was actually it was the first ETF to provide inverse exposure to another ETF. Is that correct? That that is correct. We like doing first of its kind stuff. <laughs> but listen, the timing was actually pretty good. You know, so often we see ETFs being launched at the wrong times. You know, to meet demand, uh, to bring a product to market for investors to to uh, you know use it as a vehicle to express a trade. And like I was saying earlier, usually by that time, it's too late. You know, it's too, the trend is is reaching the end of its life. But this timing was actually pretty good. You know, I have this chart here and this is ARC, uh, but that red arrow points to when you guys launched your inverse ARC ETF, SARC. Um, and it was pretty much downhill from there. Isn't that right? Yeah, I'm kind of pissed we didn't get the top looking at this chart. But, you know, and, and the problem is, the, the people who are out there launching ETFs don't trade. So we specifically did SARC. I, I mean, there are a lot of reasons why we did SARC, but one of the reasons for the timing was, you know, we started talking about this in July, uh, like June, I think, of 2021. Uh, you know, ARC had topped out February 15th. You know, it had been up 100 and something percent. You know, as someone who trades, I understand reversion to the mean. You know, I understand if something has a parabolic move like that, it's going to retrace it. And, you know, the Fed hadn't come out and specifically said they were raising interest rates at that point, but it was pretty much understood that, you know, we're probably going to go into a rising interest rate environment. And, you know, understanding the stocks that ARC owns, I mean, they're all high duration stocks. I knew they'd get crushed in that environment. So, you know, we knew the timing for something like that was probably going to be pretty good. Uh, you know, the Fed hooked us up by pivoting on inflation pretty much either right before or right after we launched. And uh, yeah, it was uh, all downhill for her and uphill for us after that. Yeah. And what made you want to, you know, launch this ETF and bet against Kathy Wood in the first place. And it wasn't Kathy Wood necessarily, it, it sort of. So, you know, all, you know, being a trader, I'm always looking, you know, hey, I wish there was a product that did this. I wish there was a product that did that. And, you know, historically, when I've been negative on the market, and, you know, I'm an ETF guy, so I buy an inverse buy or an inverse NASDAQ ETF. And, you know, the problem is, number one, you need to buy triple ever to really get any bang for your buck. And number two, when you're shorting SPY or Qs, you're shorting Amazon, Microsoft, Apple, 
So you could do it for a couple of days, but that's, you know, that's not a good long-term proposition. You know, if, if I think the market's going down, I'd rather short Teladoc, Roku, and, you know, all the crap that's in ARC. Um, and then, you know, people would, well, you know, why didn't you just create your own index? Well, now, you know, let's go to Kathy. You know, in our opinion, you know, their research is, let's say, suspect. Uh, their risk management, again, I'll say suspect. And their trading, I will say, is atrocious. So, you know, that just adds alpha to the whole mix. So really, to me, it, it's it's a better way to express you know, a negative view on the market. It's something you can hold on to for much longer than you can hold on to an inverse cues or spy position. You know, I had some guy hit hit me up on LinkedIn, you know, the other day saying, oh, you know, if, if you hold on to it for 10 years, it won't beat the s and I'm like, I'm not telling you to hold on to it for 10 years. <laughs> right. You know, it's I, a trade I, mean, yeah, I traded tactically, but you can hold on to it longer than you can hold on to an inverse cues. Yeah. And I think it's important to keep in mind too, kind of the environment when you guys launched it. Right. And, you know, Kathy was literally being talked about in the media as the next Buffett. I, I forget which news source called her that, but um, probably I remember. All. Right. You remember that was really the, the belief out there. And so, I mean, it, it, tell me if I got this wrong, but it seems like once you started seeing her not perform, not necessarily really tank, but once it wasn't catching up with the narrative of, of her being a superstar, that's when it kind of caught your eye. And of course, well, you know, and I'm it, sure it, filing for an ETF is a process, right? I, yeah. Like you said, you can't just think of the idea and then tomorrow launch this ETF. I'm sure it's a multi-month process, yeah? Well, yeah. I mean, normally it's three months, but when you're doing something first of its kind, it takes a lot longer. So we probably filed for this in, in June 2021. And, you know, theoretically, we could have launched in September. We launched in, you know, November. So it was a five month instead of a three month process. But, you know, I mean, she caught my eye early on. You know, again, we talked about the financial media. I, I've been on Wall Street for a long time. And one of the things that's fairly obvious is Wall Street is unkind to people who are uneducated. So I'm a big believer that individuals need to educate themselves. But unfortunately, they do that by going on things like CNBC. So when CNBC brings up Kathy Wood and says, hey, this is the next Warren Buffett, and you know, and I know that that's totally and completely wrong and, and dangerous, that stuff just pisses me off. So that, that oh. gets on my radar screen real quick. Yeah, I mean, anytime I think... You hear the words "the next Buffett." You should probably just run for the hills. Uh, Not but, probably. Yeah, right. But I mean, you launched it around thirty dollars, and it pretty much never looked back. Is that correct? So, unfortunately for me, I, I had planned on buying some, at, you know, at the beginning, and then I was going to buy the dips and accumulate a position because we, you know, we had a negative view on the market at that point. Uh, so it traded at twenty nine ninety five, and then yeah, it never looked back. So I bought wow. my initial shares, and then never got any more. Um, and then it got to a point where it's like I knew, you know, Murphy's law. The second I decide to buy more, it, it, it's going to tank on me. You know, so I mean, now I trade it. I mean, you know, now with this market, I'm not going to just buy it and hold on to it. I trade it. But back then, I wanted to hold the position. Uh, and yeah, yeah, I had some, I just didn't have as much as I wanted. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, it's definitely struggled this year with that rebound in growth and tech stocks. Uh, they've been really strong so far year to date, but it, I think it's still beating the S&P 500 since inception. Last time I checked, oh, it was yeah, up I mean, around it, 40%. It's, yeah, it's got to be. <laughs> I mean, it, it had a great year last year. So, you know, the S&P has got a lot of catching up to do. Yeah, I think it was up at, at its peak around 150%. But let me ask you, Matt, what would you say to critics who would say that you're betting against human innovation? <laughs> yeah, like Kathy would have said, that's un-American, which, <laughs> which, you know, in... Did she actually comment that? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. She called me un-American. So I believe for any index, you should have a long and a short... You should be able to play at both sides. I am very, very 
agnostic between long and short. I think, you know, the whole long only bias just messes people up. I think you've got to be willing to take the short side. And for any index we have out there, there is a long ETF and a short ETF. Kathy has come out multiple times and said she's the new NASDAQ. If she's yes, the new yes. NASDAQ, I mean, there are at least three ETFs that short the NASDAQ, and they're probably more than that. There's one that shorts her. So, I mean, I, you know, it, 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 it's a tool. I'm not saying you don't want to be innovative. Now, I would also question whether their portfolio is actually innovative. <laughs> you know, some of those companies, yeah, when they launched, you can make an argument they were innovative. Are they still? Yeah, I don't know. I, you know, I'm a chart guy. I'm not a fundamental guy. I'll leave it to the other fundamental guys. But, you know, is a Robinhood, is a Coinbase, is a Roku, are those innovative? Again, I'll, yep. I'll, I'll throw that out there for discussion, <laughs> but, but I would argue they probably aren't anymore. No, I think those are very valid questions. Um, but, you know, you kind of answered this before, but I'll ask you again, why not just short ARC outright? You know, uh, what, why do we need a vehicle like this? Is it somehow maybe less risk? No. So, well, I mean, yes and no. You know, I'm a huge believer that more tools are better you know, multiple ways. So you could buy puts on ARC if you want to. You know, buying puts has advantages, has disadvantages. You could short it. Advantages, disadvantages. You know, one being you can't short in an IRA. Um, maybe you can't find borrow. You know, I mean, I, you know, just, I've got a, my main account is just legacy at Schwab. I'm too lazy to move it. Schwab is awful at finding borrow. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've missed short trades on Coinbase because they can't find borrow for Coinbase, where I got guys on interactive brokers shorting it to their heart's content. So you can't always find borrow on stuff. So it's in, you know, and some people are more comfortable using an inverse ETF than they are shorting. I mean, I, I'm fine shorting, but I'm an ETF guy. I'd rather buy an inverse ETF than short something if I have that option. So it's just providing another option for people. Yeah, that makes sense to me. But let's move on to the inverse Kramer ETF, SGIM. Now, when did you launch this one? So this was launched actually four weeks ago today. Oh, okay. So it's still fairly new. Uh, now, to be fair, I should mention that you also have the long version, which is LGIM. But I think we all want to hear about the inverse Kramer ETF, SGIM. So tell us a little bit more about the methodology there. So the methodology is pretty simple. Um, everything Kramer says on Squawk on the Street, uh, through tweets during the day, if I can discern his tweet, he sent some really weird <laughs> ones. Um, and on Mad Money, we will do the opposite. And, you know, and so every day we're, we're adding new positions, we're taking off old positions, and it is a long, short portfolio. So if but there are stocks that he likes, we're shorting them. And if there are stocks he doesn't like, we're going long. But, you know, he, he makes a lot of calls. So how do you decide which ideas to fade? So we're pretty much taking everything. And so, you know, there, there's a lot of turnover in the portfolio. We're not holding on to positions long. The only ones we're holding on to for a long time are kind of the legacy stuff. So, like, he's got a man crush on Jensen Wong at uh, NVIDIA. So, I mean, oh, we've yeah. had, we've had NVIDIA the entire- dog NVIDIA? He What's named that? His dog. I'm pretty sure he named he, his dog Nvidia. He named his dog Nvidia. Oh man. And we've got a drinking game here, actually, which is why I'm usually wasted by 9 30. <laughs> For every time he says Jensen, we have to take a drink. Yeah. You know, try it once. I mean, just try it once because he'll say Jensen <laughs> like 20 times before 9 30. Oh uh, man. I don't think my liver could handle that. Yeah. So I mean, there's that. There's meta. You know, he's got a man crush on Zuckerberg. Um, you know, Lily is one that he's been on for a long time. So those, those ones we don't touch, but the lightning round stuff where people are calling in, you know, we'll probably hold on to those for about a week until we have to cycle them out for a new name. So that's, an, that's another question for you is how do you decide when to get rid of the position, when to exit the position? Is it so based on some sort of, you know, once you guys are up 20% or yeah, how do you do it? 
So we've got to exit positions every day that he's not on vacation uh, because we got to. So like today we added nine new positions. He had six on Mad Money last night and then he had three this morning. So we're exiting the older ones that, again, are not the ones he keeps talking about. But I'm also looking at how much of a profit we have. So like there was we had, you know, yesterday we had to exit some positions and GameStop and Oxy were newer ones. We have big profits in both. So I just took the money and, and, and cut those to add in some of the new ones. I see. I see. But you're looking for decisive calls from him, right? Like if he just so, comments something that's kind of ambiguous, what do you do? We're, there? we're looking for decisive calls, except on you know some of the more controversial stuff. So for example, Deutsche Bank. He okay. didn't say buy Deutsche Bank. But he said they're strong and they're going to be fine. So we took a smaller short position in Deutsche Bank just okay. because, you know, that could end up being another Bear Stearns call. So he's not saying buy Deutsche Bank, but he's saying Deutsche Bank isn't going to go under, which is probably the kiss of death. <laughs> so it sounds like you kind of position size based on his conviction, too. So we'll position size based on his conviction. We'll position size some based on volatility. Like, you know, he's he's talking about some penny stock. It's not going to have the same position size like, you know, a Procter and Gamble might. But yeah, I mean, NVIDIA and Meta are going to be larger positions than, you know, some dude calling up the lightning round and asking about, you know, Amgen or something. And I, I kind of already know the answer to this next question, but I want you to tell us a little bit more about Kramer's reaction to the ETF because... I know he's made some pu public comments on it, but what, what stood out to you? Yeah. So, you know, when we filed for it, he sent out a tweet where he said, this is the only tweet I'll, I'll mention this. And of course, it wasn't. He mentioned <laughs> it a lot. Um, you know, again, I did both sides. But, you know, on the filing, the media focused on the short side. And, you know, I'm buried on page 21. Oh, they're also doing a long um now it's been radio silence what i my guess is is they've been told not to comment on it and i've heard kind of through the grapevine they're a little bit worried which makes sense you know we've only been out a month but the sgm from a performance standpoint is killing the l gem which you know when you're bringing a guy on is like the oracle of the market you know having an etf that shorts his uh Schwartz's picks that's up for the month when the market is up for the month and is beating his long picks, it's not a great look. Um, so, you know, I, I think they're intentionally being quiet about it. You know, I do poke him a little bit on Twitter. I don't think he reads his tweets, but <laughs> are I'll you not blocked yet? Are you... What's that? Has he blocked you yet? He is not. What I think is a he doesn't read his tweets and i think there are certain words that you don't use so somebody i i replied to a tweet with something that you know probably should have gotten me blocked and then somebody else tweeted you know kramer should be sued and that guy immediately got blocked so i think like if you tweet back at him that he should be sued you're gonna get blocked so i'm 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 being somewhat careful to be sarcastic if I, if I have a dig <laughs> and so far so good. Yeah. I mean, you definitely rattled him a bit. Cause I have a few tweets of his here, you know, here he says bed bath and beyond hanging in there by writing that. Does it make it an inver inverse Kramer cell? How's that going? And we can see how it's going right here. You know, you got that arrow <laughs> pointing to when he tweeted it and yeah, it's, it's, a, it's been a rough go for Jimmy. Actually, till. Make, make it a cell. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, again, here, if I say GameStop does the if I say I like GameStop, does the inverse Kramer short GameStop? If I say it 25 times, is it is the inverse Kramer's biggest position? Should we ask the SEC? Very interesting there. And maybe not as bad here, but I think well, but actually, 25, it's at like 22. GameStop may have been one of our best trades. He actually came out uh, positive on GameStop a couple of days ago. So we shorted it. And I think we exited that trade with like a 10 and a half percent gain. Well, so that was one of my questions is what were some of his worst calls recently that you guys faded 
Uh, I mean, or maybe some of your best trades within there. Yeah, I mean, you know, what sticks out? GameStop sticks out. Oxy. So someone called him about Oxy and he said, that's Warren Buffett's favorite, not mine. So we went long that one. We made some money on that. Um, you know, we, we've had some good luck with uh, Chat AI or Chat A3, Symbol AI. I forget what the name is. It's one of those yeah. AI companies. He's come out negative on that twice. Um, and every time we've uh, we, we, we've done pretty well with that. So, you know, those are the ones that stick out since inception. Uh, oh, I mean, you know, Bitcoin. We caught the tail end of the Bitcoin run. You know, unfortunately, the fund wasn't up in January where he first made the Bitcoin call because that would have been epic. We did catch the tail run of that. So that was good. Very interesting. And, you know, I have this chart here from my friend Arun Chopra. Uh, he has been covering the whole Kramer saga at length. I'm not sure if you follow him that, but he is definitely worth a follow there. Uh, yeah, because I mean, he's send me his information offline. I would love to. I will, I will. But you know, he's been he has a great thread. I highly urge our viewers to go check it out. Uh, but here it, it are his comments on oil. You know, when oil was around negative, he said, you know, oil is going to go to zero again, and of course took off. And then towards the peak, says, you know, buy the dip on oil stocks. Once it was already a trend, you know, like I was saying earlier, there are no more incremental buyers at that point. It's become so obvious. Um so he has gotten a lot of things wrong recently and so much so that it's almost suspicious. I mean, like this guy is a veteran. He's got decades of market experience under his belt. So why is it that you think his calls have been so bad lately? So, I mean, it's not lately. It's, I mean, <laughs> remember Bear Stearns. True, true. <laughs> they, I mean, they, I think they've consistently been so bad the only reason he still is on is he's entertaining um, and he probably has pictures of somebody. Uh, but yeah, I, I've heard the conspiracy theories. I I don't believe them. Um, you know, I did have a weird experience with oil. You know, again, I, I trade my own account one one day before we had the fun. You know, I'm buying, I'm, I'm long a couple of oil stocks. I'm, I'm doing well. And he sent out a tweet saying, you know, now's the time to buy oil stocks immediately they start going down like what what's going on and you know they keep going down i'm like all right i'm gonna try something here sold my oil stocks bought a 2x inverse oil stock etf made a good amount of money on that and about an after about an hour things leveled off and i got out i have no idea what happened maybe it was just a coincidence but maybe there was someone out there who was shorting oil based on Kramer's positive oil tweet. I have no idea. Yeah, I mean, I was going to ask you if, if you think there's anything nefarious going on there, because without getting too conspiratorial, I've, I've heard theories that, you know, maybe there are CEOs or, or insiders out there who are maybe compensating him for recommending these things to raise interest. You know, if you're the Silicon Valley bank president, you know, things are about to hit the fan, uh, you know, you call up Jim Cramer and you say, I'll kick you back some if you if you recommend this thing. And again, total speculation here. So fair warning. But uh, I've definitely heard those theories where, you know, I, I, I've heard he recommends it, raises well. some interest for it and yeah. sells into the, the bids and leaves the public with with the bag. Right. Yeah, no, I've heard the theories as well. I mean, I can't imagine this guy would risk his reputation on that, but yeah, you know, who, who, who knows, you know, he, he does <laughs> the talent for, for getting things wrong. That, that is, it's impressive. Like, like I said, yeah, like impressive, suspiciously bad, but we'll, we'll leave the conspiracy theories aside. You know, we got this great tweet. Uh, Elon Musk even, even kind of gave you guys a little hat tip there. The force is strong with inverse Kramer. Yeah, someone needs to uh, give him our ticker symbol for, for his next. <laughs> Wouldn't that be great marketing? Oh, uh, yeah. well, before you go, I know your firm has a lot more to offer. 
uh, than just SARC and SGIM. So what are some of the other ETFs or product offerings that you guys have at Tunnel Capital Management that you guys are excited about? So we're, we, we've got a, a bunch of tactical ETFs. So, you know, the, the sub-advised strategies, you know, those are run by you know, a, a firm called More Capital using a technology from a company called EdgeTech. So they're tactical in nature, very active, move in and out of markets. Uh, we have our SPAC and new issue ETF, which was the first actively managed SPAC ETF and maybe the only SPAC ETF standing. You know, right now, SPACs aren't a great area of the market to be in, but that's an area that's going to come back at some point. We've got a bunch of things on the drawing board. So, you know, our our interest is in, you know, serving retail investors for the most part, um, you know, providing tools. Um, so, you know, we've got a few more coming out in that regard. We have a couple we filed for. So we just filed for a 2X DBMF, which is a managed futures fund. So this will be the only kind of way to man way to access managed futures with leverage. So we're pretty excited about that. Hopefully that'll be out within the next couple of months. And we also just filed for an emerging market ETF that excludes companies based on national security concerns. So you see like all those Chinese companies that are selling arms to Russia, those are companies that wouldn't be in our emerging market fund that may be in others. And again, we've got a bunch of stuff coming over the next couple of weeks uh, that, that should be interesting. I mean, we plan on you know at least 10 new products this year and probably a lot more. Very cool. Well, I can't wait to see what you guys cook up next. And we'll make sure to include a, a link to your website in the description of this video so our viewers can go check it out further. But we got to wrap it up now. Thank you so much for coming on the show and hope to have you back sooner rather than later. Yeah, anytime. Thank you for having me. Of course. Have a great weekend. You too. Thank you guys for watching. If you enjoyed the show, be sure to click like and subscribe and we'll see you again next week. Thanks.